Survivorship bias is something that all traders need to be aware of. If you're trading the large cap stocks that form the basis of the major stock indices and you're backtesting those, you're going to get a very biased view of the potential of your trading strategy. And I use a rather unusual analogy today to explain the point. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. If you're a talented trader looking to attract investor capital to your strategies, DarwinX is the fastest way for you to do this. We enable traders to raise third party investor capital and then charge success fees on high watermark profits. Additionally, DarwinX itself invests in its traders with our seed capital allocation program that allocates up to 90 million euros per year in successful trading strategies. So if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link here or you can find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. The analogy I'm going to use today revolves around a piece of analysis that was undertaken on warplanes. Let's take a look. During World War II, analysis was performed on many of the planes that returned from various missions. And an analysis of the bullet damage on each of the planes was plotted on a diagram like the one you see here. And then with each returning plane, additional dots would be added. And the purpose of this was to identify which parts of the plane were most susceptible to be hit. And on consideration of this data, many of the engineers set out to reinforce and strengthen these areas that seemed to be more likely to be hit by enemy fire. And initially, this appeared to be a relatively logical approach. However, when a mathematician from Columbia University got involved, Abraham Wold, he came up with exactly the opposite conclusion. Because it was only planes that returned safely that had been studied, this meant that the bullet holes being observed here were on relatively resilient parts of the plane, parts of the plane that could take the damage. But of course, no studies were possible of planes that came down during that enemy fire. And he drew the conclusion that it was the areas that were not hit on the returning planes that must have been the cause of the other planes being brought down. So these areas of the wing, this area of the fuselage here, and of course the engines and the cockpit. And so the study of only the planes that survived their missions is a prime example of what's called survivorship bias. In this example, it was essential to look past the obvious. I believe exactly the same principle applies to two aspects of trading. The first of those is survivorship bias itself. And if we look at this in terms of the trader evolution path that we've been looking at, this comes into play at this early stage of novice trader, where there's an exploration of the tradable assets that will be traded by this particular trader. And then the second is what I call positive outcome bias. And this is something that comes into play even earlier when a trader is developing their strategy. And this really focuses on that point of looking past the obvious. Now, in this episode, I'm going to focus my attention on survivorship bias. And then I'll look at positive outcome bias in the next episode. Now, survivorship bias tends to be most relevant specifically in relation to stock selection. And for the large cap stocks, there tend to be stock indices, which are effectively a weighted collection of individual stocks, such as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which contains 30 of the largest US stocks. And these stocks are often a starting point for many traders. But the problem of survivorship bias exists because these stock indices and the stocks that make them up are not static. Let's take a quick look at the Dow Jones. Between April 2019 and April 2020, 
These were the 30 stocks that made up the index. And now let's look at what it looks like today. And if we perform a comparison, we can see that there are three stocks that were in the index between 2019 and 2020 that no longer form part of the index today. That's ExxonMobil, United Technologies, and Pfizer. Those three companies have been replaced by three others, Amgen, Honeywell, and Salesforce.com. So why is this? Well, as companies in an index start to underperform compared to other companies that are not yet in the index, then those companies get switched. So let's focus on Salesforce that is now part of this index, but wasn't previously in 2020. As you can see, the current trading price of Salesforce is 227.6. But let's take a look at where this was 10 years ago, way down here, trading at a price of just 29.2. So over the last 10 years, we can see significant growth in this particular company. And it reached a peak of 300 during 2021. And at that point, it was trading at 10 times the stock price that it was 10 years ago. And it's this rapid growth of the company that meant it now forms part of the Dow Jones 30. So let's consider what this now means. Let's say a trader decides to backtest their strategy on the 30 companies that are in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And let's say they perform that backtest over the last 10 years. So because they've selected the current companies in the index, Salesforce.com would play a part in that backtest. And this individual company would contribute significantly to a positive backtest result. But the key point here is that if this trader went back in time by 10 years, they wouldn't be trading the stocks that are in the index now. They'd be trading the stocks that were in the index then. And that, of course, wouldn't include Salesforce.com, for example. This was way off being included in the index. But it would include all of those companies that have now been removed from the index because of poor performance. And so the difference in the performance of the backtest, which will be much better than could have ever been achievable in practice, is due to this bias. And this is what's called survivorship bias. And if we go back briefly to the analogy we used earlier, it's exactly the same. The engineers were initially only looking at those planes that survived, and they were making their judgments and analysis on that small subset of planes. And just like this, if a trader uses the companies that are in the index today, they're the ones that are doing well and have survived. All of those companies that began to underperform have now gone from the index and so didn't play a part in this trader's backtest. So what can traders do to avoid survivorship bias? Well, one potential approach is that they could accurately adjust the companies that form the index as that changes throughout the 10 year period. And although tricky to do, it is possible. But another approach is to turn survivorship bias to your advantage. Think about it for a moment. If a stock index is continually adjusted to only include the highest performing companies, then that surely produces a bias on the stock index itself, an upwards bias. And that, of course, is why when you look at a chart of a stock index, they almost always have this upward bias because stocks that are negatively impacting the index are removed and replaced with other stocks that will have a more positive impact on the price. And so another approach is to actually trade the stock index itself as opposed to the component stocks within it in an attempt to try to take advantage of that upwards bias. Now, I mentioned that there was another lesson that we could learn from this analogy and that is going to form the basis of the next episode around positive outcome bias. And just to give you a view of the next couple of episodes as well, 
I'm going to be covering one on backtesting, optimization, and the issues of overfitting, and then diversification and risk management, both of which play a part in the trade evolution cycle that we've been looking at. And I also want to give you a bit of a view on what's coming after this series. And many of you will remember that I've talked about correlation within a portfolio and the need for diversification before. And I always said that I'd be returning at some point to look at what I call institutional grade risk management techniques. And these will use that information about correlation of assets, but also incorporate other aspects, such as the volatility of each of the assets being traded in order to produce a portfolio that poses less risk on your equity. So keep an eye out for the first episode of that series that will be coming out in just over a week's time. Okay, so if you'd like to find out more about DarwinX and the services we offer, you can click on the link at the bottom here. If you're watching this video straight away, the next episode will be released in the next couple of days. And if it's already released, then you'll see a link to it at the top right now. Thank you for your time today, and until next time, trade safe.